thanks for coming to our book launch presentation of Dr. Saskia Hollander, who will present her book, The Politics of Referendum Use in European Democracies, obviously a very timely topic, especially in this, uh, this, this country. Uh, I am Stijn van Kessel, I'm senior lecturer at, uh, at Queen Mary at the School of Politics and International Relations. And I'll start with uh, first things first. If, if in case there is a fire, there, there are two exits. This is probably the better to, to, to run to, and then you can follow the signs outside. There's also toilets down there, and also outside there, if you turn the corner uh, first to the right, and then again to the right. Um, so having said that, uh, this event is organized um, by the Center for European Research, which is led by my colleague Sarah Wolf, uh, Dr. Sarah Wolf, also from uh, the School of Politics and International Relations. This is an interdiscipline, interdisciplinary forum for the promotion of research and teaching on Europe. And the center has recently been awarded a prestigious Jean Monnet Center, center for Excellence uh, Award. And the associated three-year program Next, Next EUK will fund research, teaching, and public engagement activities related to the future of EU-UK uh, relations. So some of me and my colleagues, or my colleagues and me rather, uh, do research on, on, on Brexit in, in various shapes and forms. Our next event, if you're interested uh, in this theme, will be on 9 December, a roundtable titled What's Next for British Democracy, uh, with four experts including three Queen Mary colleagues and our guest Prof. Pauline Schnabber from Sorbonne Nouvelle University. And the event is also sponsored, uh, supported by the Mile End Institute, and this institute is also hosted here. It brings together politicians, policymakers, academics, and the public to debate the major challenges facing the UK, so it's more focused on British politics and its capital in a fast-moving world. But as I said, today uh, we will discuss, and uh, Saskia, Dr. Saskia Hollander will present the book, The Politics of Referendum Use in European Democracies. Dr. Hollander is a political scientist uh, and director of knowledge management at The Broker, a knowledge brokering organization in the field of inclusive politics and economies based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, and we are also lucky enough to have two renowned discussants who are leading experts on referendums. Their CVs are incredibly long, but uh, I won't waste too much time, so I, I can't just do justice to their CV. But I'll give a short summary. Professor Matt Kvortrup is Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Coventry University, an expert in referendums, European politics, and comparative government. He was awarded the PSA Prize in 2013 for his research on political institutions and policy outputs, and also the Oxford University Press Law Prize in the same year. On top of that, he is the editor of the International Journal European Political Science Review, among many other activities. Uh, we also have Dr. Mario Mendes, who is based here at Queen Mary University. He's a reader in law, and his research interests are mainly in constitutional law, and one of his key interests is direct democracy. Uh, recent projects related to this include a co-authored study on referendums on EU matters, published in 2017, that was prepared for the Constitutional Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, and he also co-authored a monograph, Referendums and the European Union, a Comparative Inquiry, which was published with Cambridge University Press in 2014. So a real referendum dream team uh, all in all. And I'll, I'll first give the floor to Dr. Hollander, then give some time to the discussants to respond, and then I'll open the floor uh, for discussion. And the event will be uh, until uh, 8 o'clock, but that won't be too close. So Dr. Hollander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for your invitation and thank you very much Stein and CUR for, for organizing. And of course also thank you Matt and Mario for, for participating and for willing to give feedback on my, um, on my book. Um, so this afternoon we will talk about referendums um, and specifically the question whether referendums are the vices of the people or the vices of the political elite. And this seems a weird question because after all, um, in referendums, you vote on issues directly rather than voting on representatives to do this for you. But as I will show today, as I will argue today, um, some referendums are certainly more direct um, than others. Um, but before that, first to, um, uh, we'll, uh, to, to go back a, bit, a little bit in time, sorry. <laughs> um, my referendum journey started in 2008, uh, which was at a time that the, that the appetite for referendums was a bit on its decline. Uh, Europe just had uh, two ref uh, four referendums, but two were no to the European Constitution uh, in France and the one in my country, the Netherlands, 
Um, and this was a clear rejection, rejection of the European Constitution. So after, after that, uh, poli political enthusiasm for referendums um, declined. And this is strange, because as a, at the time of the referendum on the European Constitution, um, there was a, this discourse that uh, referendums are, were necessary in order to um, solve the democratic deficit of the European Union. And it was a very strong this discourse. Uh, referendums were also held in uh, Luxembourg and Spain uh, on the Constitution. And many other countries, including this country, um, um, uh, pledged to hold um, a referendum, but they were cancelled after the Dutch and French no. So um, the alternative that the next treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, was ratified in all European countries without the referendum, except for Ireland. Um, so there seemed to be a bit of a referendum silence. Uh, but this was a calm before the storm, because 10 years later, um, um, the referendums were clearly back on the agenda. And the Brexit referendum in this country was only one in a series of referendums um, on Europe. Um, Denmark held a referendum in, in uh, December 2000, um, I have to say it correctly, <laughs> 2015, uh, already to uh, opt in on the justice um, uh, pillar of the, of the EU, European Union. Um, Greece, of course, had a referendum in July, that's the same year, uh, on the bill out deal with the Eurozone. There was a referendum in my country in April 2016 on the EU-Ukraine association agreement. Uh, and, uh, and there was a referendum on the EU migrant quota uh, in Hungary in 2016. And what these, although these, these referendums are um, different, uh, some being uh, initiated by the government and others by, by citizens, uh, what they had in common that there were all clear rejections of, of, of Europe. So we tend to refer to these referendums uh, as offering people direct, uh, direct power. Uh, yes, is, yes, is this really the case? Um, but the British, the British people are still left in the dark about their future relationship with the European Union. And it's also questionable whether David Cameron really triggered this referendum to give the British people a direct vote. So, uh, should referendums be seen as the guises of the people or the guises of the political elite? My book, uh, my study, uh, departed from two basic assumptions in the referendum literature. So the first is that the use of national referendums uh, marks a shift from political decision making by representation to decision making by um, by direct citizens' participation. Uh, and the second assumption is that because refer because referendums are portrayed as an alternative to representative democracy, um, they are used as, as a direct response to a dissatisfaction <laughs> with representative de democracy. And the aim of my st study was. To, to examine the validity of both of these assumptions. So how did I do this? Um, my, the research design consists of two parts. Um, <coughs> first, I examined um, the availability of referendum legislation and their use in 28 uh, European member states between 1950 and, and 2017, and thereby the, I still, still included the, U, the UK. Uh, secondly, I conducted a comparative case study analysis of five countries, France, Denmark, the United Kingdom, Sweden, and the Netherlands. These countries have a different referendum tradition um, and a different uh, frequency with which referendums uh, are held. Most referendums were held in Denmark, and then France with ten referendums, and the United Kingdom, uh, Sweden with five, the United Kingdom with three, and the Netherlands with two referendums. And this excludes the referendum that was held in 2018, uh, but which, which fell outside the time frame of my, of my study. But what I first did is I provided a classification of referendums. In the referendum literature, a lot of classifications are, are being provided. I chose to distinguish referendums on the basis of the actor who's triggering the vote. Uh, and two questions are important. Either are they uh, triggered by political representatives or by citizens. And the second question is whether these groups constitute a majority in the de decision making or a minority. So then on the upper left, we first have the legislative majority referendum, which is triggered by a majority in parliament, mostly at the initiative of governments. And then we have presidential referendums, of course only possible in presidential uh, systems, triggered by the president, and since the president either holds a majority by the public or by, the, um, by parliament, uh, I put this in the, in the left upper side. Um, then there are legislative, legislative 
I struggle with this. <laughs> a few years ago, a minority referendum, uh, which is triggered by opposition parties. Uh, and this form is, is, is um, a mainly found in consent, consensus democracy, uh, democracies. And then at the right or bottom side, we have referendums initiated by citizens themselves. This can either be on legislation that is already approved by parliament, um, which is a citizen veto, um, or a referendum on an issue that citizens have drawn themselves, which are called citizen initiatives. And then as a, at a final form, there is the mandatory referendum, usually on constitutional revisions or EU treaty reforms. And this um, referendum is difficult to place in this framework because it's um, not triggered by an actor but by the constitution. But what I um, found in my research that even these referendums, which are on paper, they are mandatory, um, governments have a clear say in whether these referendums are being held <coughs> or not. Uh, of course, the position of these referendums also, de de um, also depends on other fe features, such as whether the vote is binding or advisory, uh, whether there is a turnout threshold, uh, and, and the range of issues on which um, um, referendum can be held. So to come back to the first research question, uh, has there been an increase in referendum legislation and use in the EU 28 between 1950 and 2017? The answer is yes and no. Yes, in terms of legislation. Um, there are more and more countries have adopted referendum legislation in their constitution. And currently, there are only five countries in the European Union where the constitution does not um, entail provisions for the holding of referendums, which are Belgium, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Germany, and my own country. Um, of course, in these countries, referendums can be held on a local level and also on an ad hoc basis uh, by a parliamentary majority. But the answer is no in terms of use. First of all, there is no constant growth uh, in use of referendums. Uh, although the number of countries where referendums are held um, has increased, referendum use tends to peak around um, key events such as a constitutional consolidation uh, or EU treaty uh, reforms. This can be sh this is shown in the I don't know if this okay it is clear. Uh, in this uh, figure, I made a distinction between. Um, uh, the EU 17, which includes the old EU member states plus Malta and Cyprus, and then and this is the, these are the red bars. And you can see in this group of countries um, that there has been an increase in the in the 1990s, but afterwards it's it's on its decline. But then the green mark, the green bars, um, is the same group without Ireland and Italy, and this really distorts um, the figure, as you say. If you if you don't count these um, countries in, then not so much is going on. Until five to ten referendums in ten years. And then the last group, the blue bars, is the Central and Eastern European countries. These countries use a lot of referendums, um, especially since the 1990s. I only, ca I only counted these referendums from the 1989 when they um, made a transition to the democracy. And you see that there is, um, yeah, in each uh, time frame, uh, referendums are used uh, quite often. So does this now entail a shift to, the, to, to direct democracy um, based on referendum use? Not, but even if you, but especially not when you look at the types of referendums used. Um, as I said, in all countries, even those countries which have no referendum legislation in their constitution, uh, referendums can still be um, organized by a parliamentary majority. These are then advisory. And to compare, in only 10 countries, can citizens themselves initiate a referendum? Um, and that's mainly Italy and, the, and some of the Central and Eastern European countries. In my country, this was possible between 2015 and 2018, but then the government, the current government, uh, made a decision to abolish the referendum law. Um, so, and if you look at the use, in most, referendum, most uh, old EU member states, um, referendums are triggered by a parliamentary majority, and mostly at the initiative um, of the government. This is shown in this figure as well. Um, if you look at the first, first column, you see that this the first column includes Italy and, and Ireland, and you see that 40% of the referendums are triggered by citizens. And this is because uh, almost all of these referendums were held in Italy. Um, and this can be shown if you look at the se second, because then it's only two referendums, one in Malta 
uh, and one um, in my country which were triggered by citizens. Um, for the final group, it, it's a bit different. Here you see that most referendums are indeed triggered by, by citizens themselves. But it has, has to be said that in these countries, many of these referendums were invalid because the turnout threshold was not um, reached. So, in the old member states, the conclusion has to the, the conclusion is that um, uh, most referendums are indeed triggered by political representatives. So then the question becomes: Why do polit politicians pledge referendums? So there are two dominant lines of thinking uh, in the referendum literature. Uh, one being sociological institutionalism, which argues that referendums are increasingly held um, be because of democratic values, because of democratic democratic values that people attach to referendums. And these can be intrinsic values, meaning that uh, referendums are seen as means to enhance political participation, which is seen as an end, a goal in democracy in itself. Uh, or in instrumental uh, values in which uh, referendums are seen as a means to solve a democratic deficit or to increase um, democratic legitimacy. Um, the other line of thinking is rational choice institutionalism, which says that referendums are being held because of the strategic in because of the strategic functions that referendums have in, demo in the democratic decision making. Um, the first being uh, policy seeking, so referendums can be uh, triggered to enforce an outcome that is voted down by parliament. Um, empowerment, meaning that referendums are held to strengthen the position of the actor <coughs> who triggers the vote. Um, conflict mediation, which means that the referendum can be held to smoothen contro con controversy uh, over a certain um, uh, issue. Uh, and depolitization, meaning that the ref referendum can be held to make sure that the issue uh, does not interfere with general um, elections. So there are not many studies that um, examine these referendum functions in a comparative perspective. So what I did in these five countries, in uh, France, Denmark, the UK, Sweden, and the Netherlands, um, I reconstructed the debates leading up to the referendums and see whether um, either democratic values or strategic in interests were, um, were in place. And what I found is that in almost all referendums, the politicians who uh, pledge a referendum, uh, they would prefer to these democratic values, um, either because referendums would boost political participation, uh, or because um, um, the, the democracy uh, legitimacy has to be uh, boosted. Um, but, sorry, <laughs> I'm going a bit too fast. Um, so, well, but I also found that for many referendums, almost all the deliberate referendum pledges, strategic interests were, were in place. So but what I will do now is for each referendum function, I will give some examples, not all because there are two uh, many, but I think we can, in the discussion, we can um, delve into specific examples more um, in detail. So the first is policy seeking. Um, this is out outcome contingent, meaning that the refer referendum is being held uh, to enforce a certain uh, political outcome. Um, so when there is ins insufficient support in Parliament for a policy proposal, a referendum can be used to, to enforce a decision um, is to enforce the proposal anyway, thereby the circumventing or bypassing um, parliament. But this is not a very common referendum strategy because it's largely seen as undemocratic to bypass uh, parliament. Um, but it's when the opposition uh, triggers a referendum, this is by definition uh, policy seeking because they want to circumvent um, the political majority. Um, but there are also some instances where the government, ha where governments have used the referendum for policy-seeking uh, motives. And the most obvious examples are the referendums uh, by the French President de Gaulle. Um, the, the, de Gaulle had a very difficult relationship with Parliament, so he used the referendum uh, to enforce his um, his policy proposals um, anyway. But also the Danish referendum on the Single European Act in 1986 is an example. Um, the Single European Act was voted down in Parliament. And in Denmark, it's, it's very difficult to avoid a referendum on the European Union because the Constitution states that in case of a sovereignty transfer, uh, a referendum should be held if, if there's no 5 6 majority in Parliament in favour of the treaty. And given the uh, fragmentation in Danish politics, 
intent. This is very uh, difficult to, to um, obtain. But in this case, um, um, there was no, uh, there was, there was no um, five six majority, but there was also no not a sufficient majority to enforce this referendum because then fifty percent, at least fifty percent of parliament should be in favor. This was not the case. The government wanted uh, to ratify the Single European Act, was also forced by European leaders to, to find a solution. So he called an advisory um, referendum, um, and then the Danish people voted yes. And then he said, okay, have the people backing me, so I can still ratify the, the Single European Act. Other examples are the Swedish referendums on the driving side, the pensions and nuclear energy. energy. Uh, but this was not so much um, uh, because the government wanted to bypass um, um, a parliament, but because it, it's actually, how do you say it in English? I'm sorry. It's enshrined in, in, in Swedish politics to have a minority government. So in this case, um, uh, the, there was no majority for each of the policy proposals. So in the, these cases, the referendum was necessary to enforce any decision. Um, this um, strategy is also very, it's also common in EU negotiations because in EU European Union negotiations, um, a referendum can be used to enhance the bargaining power of the, of, of the political leader who triggers it. And um, um, a very uh, timely uh, example is the Brexit referendum. Um, Cameron uh, promised to conduct renegotiations re with the European Union in order to secure a special status in, in, in the EU. And after these negotiations, he wanted to hold a referendum on it. So this forecast of a referendum, um, with this forecast of this referendum, Cameron really hoped to, uh, to get a better deal for, you, for the UK in Europe. And, and of course, it's, we all know this, this field. <laughs> Um, uh, other examples of, of, of um, referendums that were uh, held to enhance the bargaining power are the Swedish referendum on EU accession uh, and the Euro. Um, the la last one is interesting uh, because the, the Sweden does not have uh, opt out from the Euro like the UK or Denmark. Um, and so that means that as long as when it um, adheres to the convergence criteria, it has to adopt, it had to adopt the Euro. So Sweden chose deliberately to not um, adhere to these criteria so that it does not have to um, join the euro. And because of the referendum, which led to a no, um, um, this, this decision was legitimized and accepted by the European um, leaders. So these are all examples of, of, of referendums held for outcome contingent reasons, but most of the referendums that I analyzed were held because were act contingent, meaning that it was not so much the outcome of the referendum that was at stake, um, but um, the referendum, but yeah, well, I see, but the act in itself um, um, that was seen beneficial. For example, winning elections um, or or preventing a coalition split. The first act contingent um, a motive is enhancing the legitimacy of, of the uh, actor that triggers the vote. This is especially common for referendums that are um, triggered by governments um, and especially presidential referendums. And also this, this is a very typical referendum strategy if the government leader or the president is certain um, that the public is, uh, is on their side. <coughs> so examples of um, referendums held for empowerment motives are the French presidential referendums, um, and, or, and the, the Danish referendums on the Euro and the Unified Aid of course. And as I said, in, Dan in Denmark it's, it's very difficult to avoid a referendum on Europe because of the uh, constitutional um, requirements. But in this case it was not so much the, the fact that the referendum was held but the timing of the referendum. Because in both cases, in that moment the public was, was on the side of the government. Um, and especially in the, letter, in the last one, the Unified Patent Court, this was really a victory. It was um, the Unified Patent Court was um, uh, agreed on during the Danish presidency of the European Union. So it was, was really seen as if the Danish would vote yes. It was really, um, how do you say it, the cherry on the pie? Cherry on the pie? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how you say it <laughs> in, in English. So it was really, it would boost the legitimacy of the, of the incumbent um, uh, government. Also, parties in opposition or citizen groups uh, can use uh, the referendum as empowerment tool, and then it's specifically to, to, to bring down the government or to boost their own 
um, a position vis-a-vis -vis, um, the government. This was the case in the Dutch referendum on the uh, Ukraine Association 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 Agreement um, uh, with, the, with the EU. So, as I said, this referendum was triggered by citizens, not by the government, and it was on the basis of a petition. Um, and the government, the, um, the referendum was um, organized by three um, Eurosceptic organizations, uh, and they and they said in an interview before the right before the referendum, they didn't really care about Ukraine. They just awaited the first moment to, to use this new referendum legislation um, uh, to really distort relations um, with the European Union. Um, <coughs> interestingly, two, two of the initiators um, formed the political party, and one of them was really successful during the last parliamentary elections. So for this political party, this strategy really worked. And um, a very common referendum strategy is uh, conflict mediations. Referendums are very often held to smoothen conflicts within political parties or a government coalition over controversial issues. And especially Europe is, is an issue that splits uh, political parties um, uh, and coalitions, not only in this uh, country. So when a party or coalition di disagrees on a certain issue, it can pay off to submit it to a referendum in order to flip the coin to one side. Uh, or the other. I found many examples of, of this strategy. Um, uh, for example, the, the French, all the French referendums on the European Union, uh, because both the center left and the center right uh, um, in French politics are divided um, over Europe. <coughs> uh, maybe I just should not go through all of them. Um, yeah, of course, uh, what we're mentioning is, of course, the Brexit referendum. It's a very clear example uh, of a conflict mediation strategy. Uh, as you all know, the Conservative Party was terribly split uh, over Europe. And Cameron um, really tried to curtail this US skepticism within his own um, party um, by triggering a referendum. And this is interesting because years before, in 2011, he declined to hold a referendum. Uh, on the same issue, but at that time the competition, there were of course elections, at the time the competition from UKIP was so um, um, so, so large um, that, that it was kind of um, forced to, to hold a referendum anyway. Um, let me see. Yeah. So the last um, referendum strategy is depoliticization and always struggling with this word. <laughs> so, there are some English words that are really difficult for, for those people. Um, so this has been a common motive in, in, in uh, especially in the post uh, Maastricht EU uh, referendums because um, your skepticism was, was, was increasing. Um, and referendum, in this period, referendums became increasingly used to make sure that EU affairs did not interfere with general uh, elections. This is, of course, especially the case when, um, when, when faced with your skeptic uh, political parties. So by promising the electorate a referendum, a separate vote on, on an EU affair, political parties can prevent um, that these issues become decisive in, in elections. So examples uh, are, again, the French uh, referendum on the European Constitution, uh, which was pledged, pledged by French President Jacques Chirac. Um, at the time when elections were coming, and um, at the time also when the Front National, the Eurosceptic Front National, became very successful in French politics. And this party was also able to, to couple this, uh, also link uh, the European Constitution issue to the Turkey's accession of the European <coughs> Union, even boosting um, uh, Euroscepticism. Um, <coughs> then uh, the, the, the uh, Danish referendum, um, the recent referendum on its opt out uh, from justice in 2015. Um, it's n again, not because the vote was held, but again, the timing uh, was very, um, made it susceptible to a depolitization um, strategy. Initially, this referendum was to be held alongside the U Unified Patents um, Accord referendum. But for this specific issue, they, the government knew, okay, the public is not on my side, it will probably a no. Let's, let's, uh, I said, open even, let's, let's vote on this issue after the elections to make sure that it does not interfere with the referendum on the UPC, but also not in the general elections. 
and then of course um, the Brexit referendum um, and um, I, I started with the autobiography of Cameron and, and there he, he made it very clear that he had no choice to hold a referendum uh, due to the competition from, from UKIP. Also the Swedish referendums were all issues on which elections could possibly uh, be lost. So and that these referendum strategies can easily back backlash is, is of course um, seen by the recent Brexit. Um, not so recent, but by the Brexit vote. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for scientists, that's recent. Yeah. But <laughs> um, so to come back to, to one of my research questions, are referendums a response to dissatisfaction with representative democracy? I would say no. Um, of course, in all referendums I investigated, normative <coughs> arguments uh, played a role in the public debates. Um, but when politicians determine whether a referendum is held in the most cases the, po the uh, political elites do uh, determine this, then interests determine whether a referendum is held or not. Um, and the fact that there was only one country holding a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty in 2008 uh, underscores this, this <coughs> argument. And sometimes uh, referendums are uh, held because they have to be held to enforce a certain outcome, but most referendums um, uh, were deemed beneficial to achieve something else, for example, winning, uh, winning elections or preventing a coalition or a party split. Uh, yet the discourse that portrays referendums as an expression of popular sovereignty and as a response to a discontent with representative democracy is very strong. This is not in the last place because, it's because of the, the, the people who initiate the referendum use this argument to legit legitimize um, their referendums. And these arguments become especially salient as an outcome of the populist appeal to referendums, um, um, both by the populist left and the populist right. So this, this, this sounds like an open door um, that governments, uh, um, I have to say governments have not adhered to this um, populist appeal, uh, but, but populist parties simply put governments uh, on the defensive. And this, yeah, this really sounds as, as an open door, but it's important because the discourse that portrays referendums as the voice of the people is very strong. And as I would say, it also raises expectations of referendums that they simply do not meet. Um, so to conclude, my book could be read uh, as, a, as a plea to be aware of these interests underlying uh, referendum calls, um, because only then we can assess their role in democratic um, decision making. Basically, mine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is for you. I was told to put this on. Yes. But maybe a bit late to connect to the Wi Fi. Oh, yes. Well, if you still <laughs> want to connect to the Wi Fi, although it's not working very well these days, I think. Yeah, I yes, please. Thanks, thanks so much for this fascinating presentation. And, and this is, of course, and, and these very relevant conclusions, I, w I also would say, especially in this, this context. Um, I'll give the floor first to uh, Professor Matt Kvortrup. Um, first of all, Matt, you say on the back of the book, <laughs> both experts and ordinary voters should read this book. Do you still think that is the case? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Right, I don't know if you can hear me. Do I, should I stand up as well? Uh, what do you prefer? Yeah, I think I prefer to stand up, actually. Sure. Um, is there a microphone up there? Or? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just uh, take, how long have I got? Or how little have I got? Ten or so minutes. Ten or so minutes, that's fine. But Good. you've come all the way from Coventry, so... Yeah, Canada before that. You can take uh, No, 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 it's fine to... Uh, you know, as Tony Blair once said, there's nothing that cannot be said in three bullets once in 35 seconds. Uh, I'm not sure that's true for the Iraq war. Anyway, uh, that's not what we're talking about here today. So uh, when I was when I got this book, uh, I think I have to care in English, actually, Saskia, you may not know this. Uh, about three years ago, uh, I was sent a manuscript by a publisher um, asking if I would be happy to review it. And I read it and I thought, this is a pretty good book. And I said, yeah, just publish it. Um, which um, I think I had a few comments that you might have struggled over and you might have thought I was a bastard, uh, but who knows. Um, so, um, so I've seen this book in, in, in various forms. 
Uh, I did not know that I was uh, quoted on the back of it because the publisher didn't have the decency to send me. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and when I was uh, pondering this, I thought I would sort of start bombastically and, uh, and uh, with sort of like I thought something along the lines of a spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of the referendum, uh, you know, that sort of Karl Marx sort of way. And I thought it would even go on to say that, uh, you know, the old Europe had entered into an unholy alliance to exercise the spectre, the European Union, Angela Merkel, the Euro British Conservatives, and even Dutch radicals. And I thought it was like the people versus the, uh, uh, versus the, that's sort of, the, I think this guy called Boris Johnson, the people versus the parliament and all of that sort of thing. And then when I started, well, reading this book, uh, um, uh, above all, and also when I started looking at the cases, um, I realized that many of this, these are examples of the people versus the, uh, uh, versus the so-called elites. Uh, it's sort of funny thing that elites are okay in sport, but they're not okay in anything else. Um, but uh, actually, most referendums, when you think of it, are not bottom-up, they're top-down, uh, and they're a party political device. Um, and um, what is interesting about many of these referendums, which kind of what, what you say, so I'll, I'll first say what I, I agree with, mm. and I'll say the various things I may disagree with, uh, and I'm hoping I'm not overlapping with you, Mary, but I have a brief word about uh, that. Anyway, um, what is interesting about a lot of referendums is that, well, some people once, somebody once said that people would not call a referendum, or that's actually Aaron Leithart, your compatriot, says no, uh, no government would call a referendum if they expect, or they only call it when they, when they expect to win. Uh, and the problem about it is that then they, they really get it wrong. Um, I think that's what I, at some stage, called the Britain Spears theory of politics. Oops, they did it again. Uh, and you sort of like, you, you do a thing that sounds like a fantastically good idea, and then it sort of blows up in your face. And in a number of referendums where they've tried to be tactical about it, and I think you mentioned a couple of these cases, uh, they backfire. And David Cameron was a classic example of, oops, he did it again. Uh, but so too was Mitch Rye in 1992. I don't think there was so much a necessarily internal. He wanted to embarrass the, the, the right, and then suddenly, uh, and they were stooled a bit, but uh, uh, he also almost lost the, 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 the referendum. Uh, Rasmussen, uh, Miro Rasmussen in 2000, uh, had this referendum. He thought he was going to win it. Uh, he didn't. Pearson in Sweden in, in 2003 mm -hmm. mentioned and Balkan in 2005. So all of these are blow up in their faces. And these are all sort of um, fairly mainstream politicians, but even, even politicians of a, of a sort of more populist or illiberal democratic bend, or illiberal undemocratic bend like Viktor Orban. And I think you mentioned that he won that referendum. Well, it was very embarrassing because it was deemed, um, uh, um, I mean, the turnout wasn't met and there was, it was a deliberate boycott. And actually the only time Viktor Orban has lost a an electoral contest was, was that one. Mm -hmm. So it can also blow up in, in their faces. This idea about the spectre that's haunting Europe is actually the, not the spectre of the referendum, it's the spectre of uh, miscalculating elites uh, who have things that blow up in their faces. Um, so I think that when people are talking about referendums and we shouldn't have it and it's because we, we should just leave it to the politicians, well, we are leaving it to the politicians and the politicians decide to have referendums about issues that actually uh, benefit themselves. And then I think what, what is interesting uh, is that the places where you could actually have the referendum as a people's veto, um, a Roman historian called Tacitus who said that on smaller matters the chieftains decide, on great matters the people decide. And I think it should be for the people to decide on the great matters. Uh, but then sometimes it should also be for the people to decide when they want to decide on an issue. Uh, Brexit was number 14 in priorities here in Britain, uh, and then suddenly Cameron decides to do that because he's afraid that, that Farage will get too many votes. But maybe there could be ways in which the people themselves could decide. And I was a little bit surprised when I saw the original manuscript that Italy wasn't in the book, because I thought Italy would be an obvious case, and Hungary possibly as well, because they do have the citizens in, um, in citizen initiated referendums. I mean, in, in Italy, the, the law was passed that the prime minister could not go on trial. It was passed by Berlusconi, I wonder why. Uh, but, you know, he, he thought that would be a good idea. And the people then duly collect the 500,000 signatures, had a vote on it, 93% well, I beg your pardon, on a 55% uh, turnout, I think, uh, decided to, um, 
to, uh, to, to annul that law, and that was going to be duly put on trial, had to do community service, um, and um, that was the end of him. And then, you know, so people may say that Italy is ungovernable and so on, but it's, but it's not because of the people, it's because of the, of the elites. Um, so, so, I mean, I suppose these are just sort of remarks of things you could have put, and I suppose it might also be interesting to look at some of the East European or uh, Central European countries, because they do have the citizens uh, initiated referendum, um, like Slovenia, for example, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a relatively well-functioning uh, system. And then just sort of a couple of things that I was sort of pondering where, where um, I mean, we, we do agree on the, uh, this idea that, that sometimes you, you agree to disagree with. I think you, you, you mentioned that in the book, and I'll sort of spell it out a little bit more of that if you mention that. And for example, all the Swedish referendums have always been, whenever the Social Democrats are not in, then uh, the, the Conservative or Liberal or Bourgeois parties <coughs> in Sweden uh, basically agree on a little bit more sort of free enterprise and not being Social Democrats. Uh, and they always have the problem that there is a centre party in Sweden which is anti-nuclear energy, anti-the EU, but they're also sort of anti-the Social Democrats. So therefore they share something with the Conservatives. And in 1980, when they kept going to power after 37 years in opposition, they decided to have a referendum on, uh, on nuclear power because they couldn't agree. Next time they get in, uh, in, in the early 1990s, they can't agree on the EU and they kick it out to the voters. So that's a fairly common pattern. Uh, I think also um, the Danes have had that a bit. And we had here with the Lib Dems uh, and the Conservative Party when uh, Nick Clegg, if you remember him, uh, of uh, Facebook lately, uh, decided <coughs> that we should have this vote on the, what he used to call the miserable little compromise that was the alternative vote. Uh, but that was also because they, they agreed to disagree. Uh, then the only thing I, I fundamentally disagree with you on is um, is the Danish one, where you say that in Denmark you can't really avoid having a referendum. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm, well, I'm, um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to hear how you reach that conclusion, because the Danes, after they uh, had the referendum on the, the single European currency, did not have a referendum on the Nice Treaty, they did not have a referendum on the European Constitution, and they did not have a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. And then you might say, that, well, they just need the period. And the, the Danish government decided that there wasn't a transfer of sovereignty. Uh, now, in Ireland, there was transfer of sovereignty, and some uh, Danish people decided that they should appeal that to the Danish <coughs> Supreme Court. And the Danish Supreme Court says, oh, well, well we can't really answer that question because we're not a, we're a Supreme Court, we're not a constitutional court. So uh, what, what I think what is interesting about the Danish case is the Danish government decides when they transfer sovereignty. It's, not a, it's a political decision, whereas in Ireland, after the Crotty case, I mean, that's probably Memphis' uh, area, I shut up about that. Um, so, so I think um, I think some of the legal rules and, and the, 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 uh, the, the leeway, if you like, is, is not always there. But, but again, I will, will quote the, the person who wrote on the back of the book and said mm -hmm. that ordinary people should read this as well as um, <laughs> talking heads like me. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Dr. Mimbus, would you like to give comments, please? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today to discuss Saskia's uh, fascinating new book. As mentioned in the introduction, I'm a law academic here at Queen Mary. So unlike the rest of the panel who um, are political scientists, and perhaps in that sense I, I perhaps don't have necessarily the best toolkit to address some aspects of, the, of this important book that Saskia has written. Uh, but I do have research interests in direct democracy and the EU, as noted also at the beginning. And um, I'm pleased to say that I learned a great deal from um, reading uh, Saskia's um, excellent book on the politics of referendum use in European um, democracies. Really a tremendous amount of work has obviously gone into this mm. and there's much valuable insight in there. And I can say that you certainly do not have to be a political scientist, and I'm not one, um, to benefit from reading this. I wanted to focus on four to five um, issues um, in, in the minutes that I have, um, and starting with one that overlaps with Professor Quattrop's observations in relation essentially to the, the case studies that were selected um, for the book. So as you probably do when you pick up a book as an academic or, or, or non-academic for the first time and flick through the contents pages, as I did that with this book initially, I looked and I thought, hmm, five, five uh, 
case studies in five different countries, France, Denmark, the UK, Sweden, the Netherlands, and given you know, the broader topic of referendums in Europe, which itself is broader than referendums in the European Union, I, I did wonder about that case selection. Now, obviously you then flick through the book and a justification is offered for that case selection, both in the introduction to the book and in the conclusion to the book, but I thought it would be useful if Saskia might say a little bit more about the justification for those five countries in light, obviously, of the fact that, for example, as Matt also pointed out, you've got Central and Eastern European countries that have significant referendum use. And then I would also, in relation to that point, I'd also query the reference to France as being a frequent user of referendums. Mm -hmm. So as I looked at the five case studies, I looked at them and thought, OK, the country I know best, the UK, um, in this context, one I know to some extent as well, France, um, Sweden and the Netherlands, those four. And I thought, well, these are four for me non-frequent users of referendums, in fact. Only one of them, I thought, as I looked at it, counts as a frequent user of referendums, and that is Denmark. Because for France, you know, when was the last referendum? If you're French, you haven't been asked for your vote in a referendum on any issue if you're uh, under 30 years old, right? The last time was the 2005 Constitutional Treaty referendum. So I wonder, again, if a bit more might be said about case selection, whether that presents, uh, whether it might present a different picture if different cases had been focused on, while I do recognise that obviously there is the preceding chapter exploring referendum provisions and use across the 28 countries and much valuable work is in there as well. Um, then, uh, this, so that was the first point about case study selection. Uh, the second point was about the emphasis in the book on referendums being held by and to serve the interests of political elites, el elites and most notably the executive branch. And, and I was thinking when, if I'd been asked that question before looking at this book, maybe I wouldn't have known the answer to that question, you know, have more been held in that context or not. Um, but reading through the book, I very much liked the fact that you underscored, and you did it partly in the presentation as well, the fact that what is often thought of as being a constitutionally mandatory referendum is in fact frequently giving scope for political, to, political discretion as to whether a referendum should be held. And I think it's too common in the literature, both by lawyers and political scientists, to treat that category of so-called constitutionally mandatory referendums as if there is no discretion whatsoever there in relation to whether a referendum should be held, when in fact there can indeed be discretion um, in, in that respect. But, and to use an example, sorry, um, islands uh, could even be used as an, an example that's often lost sight of. In fact, in the Irish context, and Professor Courtrop alluded to this, uh, it's Supreme Court jurisprudence in Ireland that required a referendum to be held on the Single European Act in the mid-1980s. But in fact, there is an argument that not all of the referendums that Ireland has since held on EU revising treaties were actually as such mandatory. Mm -hmm. Rather, there's an argument that could be made that, in fact, if you're the Irish government, you pretty much feel like you're obligated to hold a referendum, such as on the Nice Treaty, because otherwise litigants will bring proceedings against you and this ends up in court and that's politically damaging for you. Whichever way the ruling goes, it's problematic for you. So that is illustrating, though, the point that there is arguably some scope for discretion. But I wonder whether you are actually seeing more discretion than there, than there actually is. And so I credit you for introducing there being discretion in this context, which I think is missing from much of the literature, but I wonder whether you're seeing more discretion than there actually is in this context. Um, so it'd be good if you might say something more about that, because that plays into the whole argument that really it's elites mm -hmm. that are strategically using referendums. I see personally that there's less discretion um, than you are suggesting even in the um, constitutionally mandatory referendums. A related point would be to do with not legally obligatory referendums, whether in Ireland or elsewhere, but the notion of potentially politically obligatory referendums. And I know in your talk, but also in the book, that Sweden, which pops up rightly regularly, it's one of the case studies, obviously, and how you see, for example, the accession referendum of Sweden held in the mid-1990s 
and the joining the single currency referendum. Because can't we see those two examples as in fact politically obligatory referendums rather than necessarily there being much political discretion here. That is to say that when Sweden joins the European Union at a time when its fellow Nordic neighbours are all holding referendums on joining the European Union, can Sweden really get away with joining, regardless of what its constitutional text might say, can it really get away with joining the European Union in the mid-1990s, given the implications for your sovereignty that EU membership has, without holding a referendum? Can Sweden really, not legally but politically speaking, can Sweden really sign up to the single currency in the early 2000s when its Nordic neighbour, Denmark, has rejected single currency membership in a referendum a few years earlier. So I wonder whether we can't say, well, they look like they're politically obligatory, those referendums, rather than introducing, the, rather than arguing that, in fact, there was you know, significant discretion there. And then the third, uh, turning to a third point, all your chapters, all your case studies, <coughs> conclude with sections on the future of referendums in that relevant country that you look at. And I wonder to what extent, given the emphasis on referendums being primarily executive-led, the recent experiences with referendums, Brexit being um, an obvious example where they can blow up, as Professor Courtship rightly points out, as you do as well in your book, whether that points to a lesson to be learned for the political elites, which is they need to be very, very careful, especially in a context where social media is being used and disinformation is being propagated via social media, giving you even less control over the referendum, to a future in which actually the referendum is less likely to be used. And related to that point is the future of referendums on the European Union that one of the lessons, it seems to me, that the elites at the EU level have taken from the negative experiences and the negative fallout of these referendums held on EU treaty revisions is let's not have EU treaty revisions. And it's quite telling, it seems to me, that the last time we had a major treaty revision was the Lisbon Treaty. And you might say, oh, but that wasn't that long ago. That was only 10 years ago. But the text of the Lisbon Treaty is really the text of the draft constitutional treaty that's 2003, you know, this is 16 years old. So I wonder whether one of the um, lessons um, that is emerging is that we're not going to have, in fact, referendums on EU issues because they're not going to have treaty revision. And then the very final brief point would be, so in, in effect the fifth um, observation would be, might it be said that the normative implications that flow from your study and political elites controlling the use of the referendum to use when they wish to, not the people, is that we might think about institutionalising the device in constitutional systems and taking away much of that discretion from elites by having bottom-up referendums, um, Central and Eastern European style perhaps, but again, that's one of the case studies that's not looked at um, in your um, study, or constitutional amendment related referendums, which links to Professor Courtshop's point about having the referendums on the big constitutional um, issues. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, both discussants, for these excellent comments. Uh, I'll give first the opportunity to Saskia to respond, but I ask you to be relatively selective in order to leave enough time for, for the questions from the audience. Uh, here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. So you first of all, thank you, Matt and Mario, for your, for your nice words, but also for your for your critical views. Um, um, yeah, I, I've, I've also, I always have a difficulty with collecting uh, these and then be brief, but I will try to to combine some. I think I will start with the last one, which is always always easy. But I think that it's also good to have a discussion on later because actually I really underscore at this point. It would be much better. Um, if referendums are um, institutionalized, are in the, in the constitution, then the, the bottom-up referendum would be, um, 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 if you ask me uh, on a normative level, that that would I, I think that's only direct, that's only form of direct, a uh, pure direct democracy, and I think my own country, Netherlands, is a very interesting case because 
Um, and I didn't tell Peter to do my presentation because it would be too long. Um, but as I said, our country does not have referendum legislation in the, in the Constitution, but it has been an issue for, for decades. Uh, and uh, so we have a system, it's very difficult to uh, change our Constitution. There have to be election in between, and then by qualified majority it has to be approved. And there were, over, over the years, many, many proposals to introduce the referendum. And interestingly, only a citizens initiated referendums. The, never was there a discussion on whether we should have referendums by a parliamentary majority, not even the constitutional referendum. I, I think it was discussed um, in, in the 60s. Uh, but later on, it was only the citizen initiated referendum that, that was being discussed and where proposals were uh, formulated. So I think um, uh, it, it's not a good case because it has now been abolished. So even if there is legislation, uh, political parties can um, turn it back, so to say. But if you would ask me, I, I just mm -hmm. completely agree. I think I would just go go the other way around. Uh, sure. Um, um, because also, yeah, uh, um, about the um, um, about the future of referendums, and it's always difficult for political scientists to make predictions. Uh, I think most of them they don't make predictions. Um, and I have to say that when I wrote this book. Um, it was pre-Brexit, uh, so at that time there was a um, yeah the, uh, the enthusiasm for referendums was back, and then um, when I entered into Palgrave, then <laughs> all the things changed. So I had to revise. Therefore, it took it took so long um, uh, in the end. Uh, but I think what you what you see now it's it's not only that we uh, that that um, governments are reluctant to hold referendums, they're also reluctant to have these major treaty provisions. And I think there's a very interesting article by, and I can never pronounce his name, you can have do it better, Schimmelpen. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, which actually uh, touches upon this, this issue, that it, because of this referendum um, forecast, um, um, yeah, and you, you can decide whether that, that's, that's good or not good. I think that that's the reality um, that, that we have to deal um, with. I think I will say something about case selection because there are many comments um, on this. Um, what I wanted to do, okay, uh, I, I agree with you, it would have been nice to include Italy. It would have been nice to include one of the Central and Eastern European countries, at least a country where citizens, referendums by citizens are possible. Um, but this was not the aim of my study. I departed from the idea, um, from the notion that referendums are held because political elites think they should be held because of normative reasons, because they have to solve the democratic deficit or they have to boost participation. So therefore, I almost deliberately uh, chose not to include countries where the most of the referendums are um, held by citizens, um, which of course not, not yeah, it's, it's selecting on a d dependent variable uh, from a political scientist's point of view, that's not um, um, very popular, I would say. Um, but I think even in Italy, uh, many of the referendums that are initiated by citizens are hijacked by political parties. And I think you know the Italian case m much better than, than I do. But I think that even if that also applies to Central and Eastern European countries. Um, and I think the Dutch referendum on the EU Association Agreement is a very good example. So even if we have a referendum um, that is organized by citizens, by petition, then still we have to be aware uh, of why are they calling a referendum and which political parties um, uh, join their, their, their cause, um, I would say. Um, so why why then these five countries? And I completely agree. France was a struggle because if you if you look at the whole European like 28 countries, then France yeah, it should be at the lower uh, 10. Is, 10 is not that much, and especially because after 2005, no referendum has been held. But if if uh, you exclude the Central East European countries and then look at the old member states uh, without Italy and Ireland, then it's still then it's then 10 is more than in the other. But it's it's ambiguous. It's it's arbitrary, um, um, so to say. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to um, uh, compare countries which were similar in in terms of political system or more more or less similar. So I chose the United Kingdom and France because they are both majoritarian democracies. 
Um, and also uh, chose some countries which are consensus um, democracies. Um, so the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden. So I think this is like this mixed um, design allowed me to really look at the referendum motives in different political uh, constellations and also um, test the validity uh, of my conclusions um, as well. Um, do I still have time? Yeah. Uh, let part. me see, let me see, let me see. Ah, about, about Denmark, yeah, I think this is an interesting point. Um, maybe I said it too, too bluntly, because I think that in the literature, Denmark is um, very often referred to as countries where referendums on Europe are unavoidable. Yeah. And what I, not what I wanted to show, but what I show is that this is not the case. I, I think that I show exactly what, what you say, yeah, but <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, because that's really my, like even, even in countries uh, with, with a very constitutional requirement to hold referendums on Europe, they can still be avoided or used mm. uh, strategically. And I didn't <coughs> mention that, that one, but um, Denmark also, also avoided the referendum on the fiscal comp uh, comp um, oh, yeah. uh, compact. And Ireland did have a referendum on it. Mm. Um, a random, um, uh, Ireland did not have a referendum on the banking union. You can uh, you can say that that um, uh, especially for Ireland, if there have been so many referendums, um, they avoided the referendum on the banking union. It's it's kind of tricky. Mm. So I think e yeah, it, it underscores the, the point that you both are making making that even mandatory referendums are not that mandatory. Um, shall I leave it by? Wait yeah, I think the, 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 the audience is, is dying to uh, ask some questions, but an ex excellent response to these excellent comments. Anyone who would like to ask a question? Yes, the gentleman there. No other? <coughs> yeah, I think you can go. Oh, the microphone's coming. Thank you very much for your presentation. The, um, one or two thoughts occurred to me. Um, <clears throat> some politicians have got a 100% record on referenda winning everyone. Tony Blair never lost one. Harold Wilson had one, which he, he, um, which he won. The, the other point is um, certainly talked about bottom-up referenda. I think S Switzerland has had more referenda than it had hot dinners. And you only need so many um, signatures to trigger a referenda. So you, you have one on things like the, the deep uh, <coughs> tunnel under the Alps um, a, f a few years ago, and that's one. The, um, some referenda, not 50-50, they can be 60-40 or other. And if, if Cameron had had, say, 55-45, he would have won the referendum. And just the last thought was that um, <coughs> referenda are very often used by dictators to justify. The Nazis were very fond of referenda and things like the Anschluss with Austria, the the union with the Saar in 1935, and I think there were other ones as well, which, not surprisingly, because they had a, a huge propaganda machine, he would win with 80% of the vote. And um, th th <coughs> I don't think uh, th th David Cameron would have died for uh, something like that. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Yes, gentlemen, over there. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking that oh, I'm thinking that in this research, uh, were you influenced or needed to consider the simplicity or complexity of the questions? Because it seems with referendum, the more simple it, it is, then you get a result. But otherwise, it caught it continues on a more difficult path so, and also perhaps what was mentioned on Switzerland perhaps they don't have trouble with referendums because they have so many uh, whereas perhaps 
if the in your study the referendum there are less referendums is it a bigger deal or more of a problem when there is one one final question for this round before i let the speakers yes sorry Oops. um i guess i also wanted to refer back to switzerland although i know you've not focused on that sorry um i wondered if you do consider that as in shorthand politically tainted as the others that you've talked about or or is it a factor when you do get more referenda there's a sort of evening out that goes on and i also wanted to i suppose related to that that when there are very few referenda and i'm thinking of the the um, the Brexit referendum here, and also the one that you relate, um, referred to, the Ukraine one in Holland, that, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I was, had some connection with the people involved in that, and it seemed to me that that was about the only chance that they people had to um, have some opinion on the whole of the EU's trade agenda, which they had been... Uh, fighting and opposing for so long but hadn't had any say on it and so um, you kind of dismiss that as being politically motivated for a political end but there's also the aspect that that was probably the first time they ever got a chance to, to say anything on an EU trade agreement um, and of course I know that your study uh, hasn't looked uh, at this at all but um, the aspect of the results of referenda, so the, the ones on the EU constitution in um, Holland and France, I believe, I think they're in the same weekend, um, both voted against it. And what did the EU do? Just change the name of it. <laughs> so it's quite a big issue if you're going to have a referenda and that's what comes out of it. Saskia, and then I'll also let the other panelists respond. Can I talk a little bit first? Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that this is a very um, uh, good point. And I think I, I think it's actually funny that we are discussing where time is for a half, one and a half hour, and before the discussion, Switzerland didn't. <laughs> I think that's good because I think um, Switzerland is such a unique case. I, I I didn't include it in my in my analysis because of the European <coughs> Union country, um, but I think it, it's it's also a difficulty to the country where the, the um, the, tr the democratic tradition is so different, um, um, of course, that there's no real government and opposition dynamics in Switzerland. So I think it's very difficult to, to compare um, Switzerland, but I, I'm sure, I'm not, you know, the Swiss case very well, so you can reflect a bit more um, uh, on that. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing here is, can we learn from referendums? Is it the case that if, if countries have more referendums, um, will the outcome then will, will more be a yes will it be more often be a yes uh, or will the discussion be better I think that's also um, a very common uh, argument that if there are more referendums we learn how to how to discuss topics um, but and I'm, I, I should not quote but I don't, don't know the exact quote but I think Satori said something you do not learn uh, to vote by voting I mean you, maybe you know um, uh, more but I, I, so I think this is a very difficult argument. I think um, uh, also in Denmark, um, uh, discussion are not always on, it is on the European Union, but also with, with the Eurosceptic populist parties, uh, debates become, um, how do you say that, tainted? Is that, yeah. a, is that a word? Contain, but, it's, yeah. but it's not only a referendum, it's also, it's all also in elections, it's, it's the case. So I, I I'm, don't know whether that, that's a bad thing or, or, um, or not. Um, maybe yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll should I think it. about the other points? <laughs> I don't want to say that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I can address your points and, and, and also a few points about Switzerland. I mean, the Swiss, uh, I mean, they vote often, and if roughly uh, there are, I don't know if I should put this one on. Uh, uh, they vote, vote about 16 times a year. I mean, was, if, well, they go to the polls four times a year, and in, in total they have referendums 16 times a year. And recently in Switzerland there was a referendum uh, where the court said that the people had been misled and they have to re-vote. They've had that in, in, uh, in Slovenia as well, which is, I'm just saying that for, for interest, if you like. 
Uh, then, um, so, but in Swi the Swiss also, I don't think they, they become, you know, they, they, they don't learn to be, be sensible because they vote all the time. They've, they've been about 13 referendums on immigration uh, and 11 of them have, uh, have been won by the progressive side and you would have thought, oh, well, the Swiss are open. And then suddenly there's a referendum on whether they should be allowed to have minarets. And they said, no, we shouldn't. Uh, and they previously, back in the day, I mean, they voted, I think, three times before they gave women the vote. Uh, so, so, so the Swiss aren't angels. Um, on on, uh, on uh, just the, the, the last two points when he said Tony Blair never lost a referendum, well, he did lose one about the, uh, the Northeastern Regional Assembly in 2004. Um, and, uh, and I remember I lost out on a research grant because there were going to be other referendums. So therefore, I've, I have that. Uh, it, it, it hurts a lot, that one. And then you say the thing about uh, dictators like referendums. That's true. I mean, Pinochet have had referendums, Hitler, Mussolini, uh, Ceausescu, Eric Honecker, and the list goes on. Uh, the difference between those uh, referendums in dictatorships is, and I call them plebiscites, in France they call them plebiscites, uh, is that first of all, they're not fair at all. Uh, you know, in, in Nazi Germany where they had four referendums, uh, on one occasion a, there's a, 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 a letter to, uh, or a, a, has been sent to a, a concentration, a Gauleiter, who's one of the, 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 the runs a concentration camp, and he's questioned, why did you only get 80% of the votes, couldn't you, these people are in turn, they should have voted for Hitler, even if they're in concentration camps. So, so I think the thing about Hitler and having referendums, but then again, Stalin had representative elections, there was a parliament in Russia, and some people say, we don't want to have referendums because Hitler had them. Well, what, would we then abolish parliaments because they have them in North Korea? Um, I don't think so, so uh, that's, yeah. On, on that note, I'll hand it on to you, Mario. Um, a few observations, sorry, in relation to your comments as well on the Tony Blair not having lost a referendum. I was going to say, but of course, he never held a national referendum, mm. of course. So, mm. in fact, the only referendums that have been held under Tony Blair have been at the sub national level. So, uh, mm. in relation to the Swiss point, you bring introducing Switzerland into the conversation. Switzerland is, of course, an outlier. Mm. And Saskia excludes coverage of Switzerland um, from the book as an outline. It really is an outline mm. in thorough democracy um, terms. The comments in relation to, from the lady over here, in relation to uh, trade agreements, I would, however, for what it's worth, point out that in the emphasis on the people not having had a say in relation to it, having been fighting for a say in relation to the trade ag agenda. I have my reservations about the extent to which the people have really been um, seeking to have a say, as, as a general point in relation to the EU, seeking to have a say about the EU's trade agenda, that there's some um, significant movement in, in, in that respect. <coughs> but in any event, as a comparative point, I would emphasize in this respect that in which country, because one doesn't spring to mind, do the people actually have a say over that nation's trade agreements in a direct democratic sense? That is, a vote on your country's trade agreements. And one, I think, a Latin American example springs to mind where there was a referendum on a uh, trade agreement. But otherwise, maybe it was Costa Rica. Um, but otherwise, there may be a case for the people to have. Uh, yeah, that, that was the point I was making. That that was the first chance they did have to. To, uh, to anything. In the trade related context, yeah, in the yeah. EU trade related context, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm not disagreeing that that was the first chance, um, precisely because you don't get the chance to have a popular vote on the EU's trade agreements. My point partly was just to put this in comparative context to say that that's, there's nothing anomalous in that, comparatively speaking, but one might seek to make the case for the people having a say in future over trade agreements, not just in the EU, but elsewhere, given how um, significant they are. Yeah, and if I may add, because I think it's a very valid point, if you look at um, the Netherlands, where we were referring to, I think that the reason, one of the reasons why this referendum law was abolished was exactly because or organizations already try to organize a referendum on the trade agreement with Canada, that's what the, uh, the CETA, the CETA uh, agreement. So, so there were, of course, more reasons that this government just doesn't like referendums, but, but this, um, exactly because now the voters were given the chance to vote on, on, on European Union um, uh, policies or treaties, 
uh, and if you never give them that choice, then then they will vote no, especially in in times of rising U.S. skepticism. So it is a very valid um, point. And I think it's uh, sorry. <laughs> it's also where the where the where the populist left and right unite, especially on on trade agreements. So I think the the risk um, for having a referendum is even bigger in, in these kinds of that there's that sort of idea of, of people can vote by proxy as, as well. Um, so, so you wait for that referendum and then that's the, the chance you have to be, to say you're angry. I mean, a, a referendum is a safety valve. Uh, and if you, if you only allow people to let out steam so often, they would let out steam even at time when it's not appropriate to let out steam about that issue. Now the metaphor is getting, getting, uh, getting sort of a bit of worn. But I think one of those interesting things where you said that we don't do predictions. I mean, I, I did a prediction of the Brexit referendum, and I got it right, I have to say, <laughs> four months before. And I was honorably mentioned in the Daily Express, which did not give me a lot of friends in my department. <laughs> and I said to say, I, I, you know, don't blame the messenger. But one of the things I did in that sort of fairly statistical paper was to look at how long a government's been in office. And basically, if you've been in office for a long time, people don't trust you and people start to hate you. Uh, so when Callaghan had been in for a long time, of course they lost the referendums in Scotland in 79. Uh, when the Danish Conservative government had been in for a long time, they lost the, the, um, the, the Maastricht Treaty in the same way as they, when they had their honeymoon, would, would win the, the uh, Single European Act. So sometimes referendums are really about representative issues, and we don't like these guys. And I think David Cameron had just been in for that little bit too long. Uh, and then, you know, Monsec Fonseca papers and other things sort of like uh, don't really help and then, then you tend to lose. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, referendums aren't perfect, but I think you need to have them as a corrective to represent democracy. Any other questions? I see one in the left here. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to follow on from the previous point about giving citizens a say about the topic of the, of the referenda. In the last two referendums in Ireland, we had a two-year conversation via Citizens' Assembly on both issues, and this provided an opportunity for 100 citizens to be randomly selected, um, legal experts were brought in, policy experts were brought in on the issues, religious experts were brought in on the abortion issue, um, and then marriage equality experts were brought in on that referendum. So we had a two-year conversation prior to the vote, and it also led to the government publishing heads of bills of legislation. So we knew we had the text in our hand before we went into the ballot box. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on giving citizens a greater say on the policy issues and more kind of dispelling the misinformation that can occur during referendum campaigns? Any more? Yes. Thanks. That's absolutely linked to what's just been said in the, the, the previous comment. I, I wondered whether you'd looked at um, uh, how many and compared how many cases were uh, votes were conducted where the population actually knew what they were voting about um, and were fully informed, and compared with um, the extent to which people were just voting on emotion. question no yes sorry almost missed it thank you oh just following on from the point um two points that were made and just around sort of this issue of disinformation during sort of campaigns like uk uh, 2016 referendum as an example and whether this is going to change the kind of how referendums like whether referendums are conducted and like change the future of referendums and is there a sort of danger in holding referendums that we see? <laughs> yeah, no, I really like the reference to, to Ireland because I think that this is this is this example of Ireland. I think Europe, I think maybe <laughs> the world even should follow this example because I, I think if referendums are linked with more deliberative forms of democracy, so if you have a proper discussion between citizens, um, then it's then it's much better, and it, then it's really really bottom up. Um, and I think that's even better than than having um, uh, like a citizen's veto where the proposal is already there. 
Um, so I think I, I, I can only underscore this. I, I think Luxembourg had this as well, right? I mean, because we know that they, they recently had an act that was not, more in it's not in the same way as well. No, not in the same way, but, but yeah, also, um, um, and I think some, some nice proposals um, came out as, as well. So, no, I would completely underscore this um, um, issue. And I, I didn't do research on whether people were, were disinformed. I think that there are uh, many studies that, that do. Um, and I think in many cases, people, um, the voters are being misinformed. But then again, it's also in the normal elections, people also get misinformed. And uh, I think it's very, and that's basically one of the pleas of my, of my book, is to not see referendums as co something completely different than, than normal elections. It has to, there are the same mechanisms, the same political strategies that, that underlie this. So we should not see it as something alternative to parliamentary democracy or elections. Mario, Matt? Yes, okay. Um, uh, thank you also for introducing Ireland. I actually jotted down Ireland in my notes in relation to the previous first round of questions. I think it may have been the lady in the front pointing to the difference, um, whether there's a difference when you are in a effectively a constitutional system where they have more experience with referendums. And I jotted down Ireland rather than Switzerland for these reasons, because it's not as frequent as Switzerland, but it's a fascinating example in, you know, in our nearest neighbour, right, that mm -hmm. has been doing very interesting things in relation to the exercise of referendums and I think there is an important distinction to be made there between having a referendums taking place in an institutionalized system not just that has constitutional regulation on a referendum or, ref or legislation on a referendum like the UK does and has had as Saskia's book points out since 2000 <laughs> but a system that actually uses it reasonably regularly and then there might be differences in terms of the willingness of the people to give the government of the day a bloody nose because they're more able to see it as a referendum on that particular issue. Uh, so Ireland's a fantastic uh, example for, for our purposes. On the issue, the, the, the next question about um, being fully informed, just um, voting on emotion and the like, um, Saskia was partly dealing with that and drawing an analogy between the national elections but of course there is an important difference here that we have to keep in mind that Brexit brings home of course which is that unlike a national election where you can vote the rascals out next time round the disinformation that can flow in the context of a referendum campaign can lead to once in a lifetime decisions if the UK leaves the European Union can the UK and under what circumstances could it go back in it's not that you get another chance four years later or as currently the case in the UK it seems to be that we're having very regular general <laughs> elections mm. um, and then um, I was suggesting in, res in discussing Saskia's book that the concerns with disinformation and the like are likely to lead elites particularly within the EU context to avoid um, things that generate referendums for that reason it's quite an obvious uh, reaction to that if you're talking about revising the EU treaties and you know that disinformation is a problem um, that has been manifest in certain elections, then you're going to have, you're already having second thoughts about the benefits of a future treaty revision that might trigger a referendum, but you're really going to avoid it in the current setup that your finds itself. Yeah, just uh, lastly on Ireland, what is interesting about the Irish case is that the Citizens' Assembly took a vote after they had deliberated, and 67, I think it was on the, uh, the, uh, the marriage equality one, uh, and 67% of the people in the Citizens' Assembly voted for the amendment, which was, I think, only 2% more than the people in the referendum, after, which is, a, and, you know, I, we love Ireland, we all do, uh, and there's nothing not to love Ireland about. And there's an element of schadenfreude on the island of Ireland at the moment, but that's, I think that's going to be fair enough. Then on the Brexit one, and people are well informed, and you said, well, vote on emotional issues, well, emotions are okay, I think. I mean, it's, it's okay. I mean, I think David Hume once says, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. And I think if, if you have an emotional attachment to something, then that is a reasonable thing too. And some, I mean, in the Brexit referendum, people were, were, it was spelled out to them what would happen. That did happen in some cases. Mm. Um, but also, I think in, in a number of other cases, I think in the Netherlands in 2005, 
uh, there was a poster which was then quickly withdrawn, which said basically concentration camps will be back if we don't buy Germany in, we know what they're like. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to be the, the rational parties that did that. I think it was the Liberal mm -hmm. Party, wasn't it? Or was it, no, CD, it was the Christian Democrats, I think. Um, so sometimes, and we had in Scotland, uh, you could say, then there was the other way around. I mean, the, the, uh, Alex Salmond, First Minister of Scotland, for those who, who, who've forgotten him, uh, uh, always said in his campaign, we have to put a kilt around it, which is a wonderful Scottish way. Mm -hmm. But most people in Scotland couldn't care less about putting a kilt around it because they said, at the end of the day, you know, economics is more important. So maybe it's just because Scottish people are more economically rational than English people. I don't know. <laughs> On that note, uh, <laughs> it's, it's time, I'm afraid. I thought this was excellent. I hope you uh, will join me in thanking uh, Saskia Hollander, of course, Matt Kvortrup and Mario Mendes for this excellent uh, discussion. <laughs> you may <applaud. laughs> And I thank the speakers with our famous Merry Goody Bag. <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and again, our next event will be on the 9th of December, at least the one organized by the Center for European Research. The Mile End Institute has many more okay. e events. <laughs> Do you want to advertise them? Um, just before you go, 4 November, Maya Goodfellow, we we'll talk about the hostile environment, how immigrants became scapegoats. Then on the 11th, we're going to have a panel event, data rights, subjects of citizens. And on the 18th, we're going to have a very topical debate about Corbynomics, which probably will be a campaign-related event. Thank you. Thank you, colleague Dr. Sahuria. And uh, on the 9th, we have our next Center for European Research event, which will be a roundtable on what's next for British democracy.